is more of a review for a lot of you um, because I feel like it would be very strange if you got to this point and not talked about regression. Um, but we're going to talk about regression as applied to some special linguistic stuff. And this is in our continuous data section. Right? So this is all mostly only dealing with con continuous data, although we can have categorical predictors, which we'll do. So I want to talk tonight about the English Lexicon Projects because it's one of my favorite things. Um, the Subtitle Projects, which is the second favorite thing. And then a little bit of an extension to Priming Projects. Okay. So the English Lexicon Project, which don't tell Dave Valota, but their website is terrible, right? Yeah. Is a, um, a large undertaking where they had people um, doing a lexical decision task, which I'll show you what that looks like in a minute, that really helped kickstart this trend towards publishing behavior, behavioral data. So a lot of the data that we've worked with so far has been corpora-based or where people have hand-coded data sets or we've grabbed them off of Twitter or something like that. This is still linguistic, it's still about language, but it's um, behavioral data. So people are rating something, or they're judging something, or um, maybe even giving opinions. And that's kind of invaluable in linguistic research uh, in lots of ways. But the lexicon projects allowed us to think about like how fast should people actually read words. And you would think that we would know this, but we don't very well. Um, and that's really important for understanding, like, how long should people spend on a page? If you're going to force them to stay a certain amount of time, like how long should it take them to read? Um, so we can catch cheaters or speeders sometimes is what they're called in research projects. Um, so there's lots of uses for this data. Now, corpora have been around for a long time, big corpus data sets. Um, the internet really made those easier to share and to use. And linguistic databases have been around for a long time. But in the last 10 to 20 years, the idea of publishing those so people can cite them and use them is kind of new. <clears throat> and so we have a project where we're tracking the use of these over time, and we just see this like kind of, you know, it grows a little bit, a little bit, and then exponentially. So the English Lexicon Project itself has 40,000 words in it and 40,000 non-words with many characteristics. And you're probably thinking, like, why would we care about non-words? Well, non-words are sort of an interesting uh, phenomenon, like understanding dyslexia. It's very helpful for, for thinking about non-words. How do people pronounce things? Like how, when we encounter a word we've never seen before, what happens? So non-words have some useful um, attributes that can help us study real reading. In that people completed a lexical decision and a naming task. And I have a demo here of a lexical decision task. Unfortunately, I've, oh, hold on, sorry. I've seen it about like 100 times, so I'll try to not suck at it. All right. So, let's start. so it says I'm going to see two words at a time. Now, often in a lexical decision task, you'd only see one at a time, but in this one, we're going to see two. If they're both real words, I'm going to press the A button. If one or both of them are fake words or nonsense words, I'm going to press the L button. Um, because this is a QWERTY keyboard, really. So both real, A, fake, fake, real, real, fake. Fake, <laughs> that one was hard. Uh, real, real, and then this. So hold this thought because we're going to come back to it in just a second. Okay. And so in the actual ELP or English Lexicon Project, they only saw one word at a time. In that example, you see two because it's talking about priming. Um, but in a real LDT task, you just do one at a time. Real thick, real thick, real thick. It's very kind of monotonous, but like in a, like, you know, there are those things that you do that are like very repetitive, but it's kind of soothing, personally. I think real students in these studies get very bored. But in a naming task, 
you would just read those words aloud. So I would say like nart, thief, um, or I think it's like treat actually. <laughs> Doctor, Filippo, nurse, right? Bread, butter. And what we're gonna do in today's um, class is try to predict those response latencies. Right? So response latency is how long it takes you to make a decision and respond. Sometimes you'll see people call these reaction times, and I reserve reaction time for, for how fast it takes you to, to react to something, which like if I made a loud noise and you turned your head really quickly, that's a reaction. A response latency, however, is how long it takes you to make a decision and then respond. So kind of reserve reaction time for like uh, involuntary and kind of things that happen um, without too much thinking. Uh, whereas response latencies require some sort of decision. But a lot of people use them interchangeably, so FYI. <clears throat> now the second half to this equation is the subtitle projects. So this started with Bryce Barton New, who wrote multiple papers on this. I think Mark has written like 15. Um, and this was a movement to rethink frequency. So if you've taken 520 or ever done some NLP work, you've probably encountered the brown corpus. And that for a long time was the um, premier database to estimate word frequency. Because word frequency predicts almost everything <laughs> in English. Like it's a very important variable. And um, the other one that you might see would be the HAL corpus by Burgess and Live say. And then there was an uh, uh, one more that's really popular that's still pretty popular actually is the TASA, so Touchstone Applied Sciences Corpus that LSA used. And so these were just available and easy and they appear to be predictive. But what Bryce Bard knew were arguing was like those, the so brown corpus is from the 60s, here we are nearly 60 years later. Um, wait, I, can I math? Yeah, something like that. 30, 30 uh, plus 50. Yeah, so it's close to 60. Um, <clears throat> and there's just no reason to believe that those word frequencies are representative of the way we use English now, especially because the brown corpus is only about a million words. And obviously, um, there are corpora now that are way bigger. So instead, um, what can we use to estimate frequency to use as one of our predictive variables? And this is called the subtitle projects for a reason. What they did was they downloaded subtitles from the Open Subtitles website. Um, and then that provided us estimates for, for subtitles in movies and music lyrics. And the movie ones seemed to work better. And any kind of model that they built using estimating lexical decision or naming times um, indicated that the subtitle estimations of frequency were much better predictors than anything else. So you can kind of look at the subtitles data set by using their shiny app. It makes me so happy that it's a shiny app. Um, just like it makes my heart happy. <laughs> And there is actually a Python package that has a lot of the other languages. So right now, this the Shiny app only has English and French and kind of a mixed bag. Um, the uh, There's a package called Substivec, which is um, includes a lot of the data for other languages, up to 55. So I'm doing several projects with this new data set because the Substivec thing is really, really new. Um, and uh, we're trying to work on building some of these models <clears throat> in other languages than English. Right? But what we get is like we have um, a translation here in the multiple languages of how frequent words are in different languages. So in American English, airplane is um, moderately infrequent. I don't um, remember exactly if this is parts per million, exactly what the number means here. Um, and then they have airplanes translation in a bunch of other languages. All right. So it's now been expanded to 55 languages. 
Uh, there are about 20 of these that are published and the rest are probably coming out soon. Um, the biggest issue is that many of the languages that aren't published just don't have enough data. So like Africans is on the list, <clears throat> but there is not nearly enough words there for it to be a good representation of the language. Right? And then English is definitely the largest data set they have. And that brings me to a final project, a semantic priming project. <clears throat> So what is priming? Well, priming is this really cool cognitive mechanism that allows us to um, be better at a lot of the things we do. So we've talked before about how we generate um, an expectation of what's coming next. And we build computer models to predict that kind of stuff. But as we're reading, we know people are trying to figure out what's next. And what we think happens is this idea of, of spreading activation. So priming is the mechanism in which um, some sort of cognitive processing, reading okay, is a cognitive process, that speeds up. It's faster than it would have been because something else already happened to you. And what, you see this a lot in like literature of like, oh, if we prime people to think about money, they do this. Or there was a big thing for a while about um, power posing that um, people kind of didn't believe was real. But like cognitive priming and reading is pretty stable. Like we know that it's mostly a thing. Okay. And we use lexical decision and naming tasks to measure priming. And what you do is you manipulate the types of trials. So this is what that, that little study we just did actually does. So if I saw doctor and then I saw tree next, so those two words are unrelated, unless you've read these slides 10 hundred times. <laughs> if I saw doctor and then I saw nurse, those are semantically related. And then we have our, um, our nonsense word trials. Now we should be faster if the word nurse because we saw the word doctor, than if we saw uh, tree nurse. Okay, so the, the word nurse is speeded from seeing doctor in front of it, whereas tree is read at its normal rate um, in comparison to doc, because we saw doctor before it. So let's look at my results. Okay. This time it actually worked out okay. Um, for related words, I was faster than unrelated words. That was be what you would expect if there were priming. You should see speeded response latencies because their words are related to each other. And then generally what you see is nonsense words are the slowest of them all. Um, I've also taken this example many times now and I usually don't <laughs> get the results right anymore. But this related is what you should see. Related should be faster than unrelated and then nonsense words are typically the slowest. And so what we think happens is what's called spreading activation. Okay. So let's say you have fire engine uh, here. That's what this middle word is, even though the picture came out kind of small. Um, when one sees a word, we kind of think about this as like water rolling, like spreading out because you spilled it, okay, like the Collins and Loftus models. Um, and, or Collins and Quillian, rather. Uh, no, Collins and Loftus, the second one. Uh, what happens is all the words that are sort of related through whatever mechanism uh, also get activated. And so they're faster because you're already kind of thinking about them. And um, the other ways that people think this happened is uh, a deliberate process. Spreading activation is considered involuntary. Um, a deliberate process or, or an active process called expectancy generation. So I see doctor, I expect to see nurse because I know it's related. And a couple of other uh, other mechanisms that people have proposed, but either way, it's a thing that happens. Okay. And so the semantic priming project data contains lexical decision and response, naming response latencies for related, unrelated, and non-word trials. Okay. They paired it with the English lexicon project and the subtitle projects, okay. and that gives us more data. So we can predict the response latencies from the English Lexicon project, or we can predict the priming latencies from these uh, semantic priming projects. And this here is a really great final project, if you're interested. I've had people use this data before. 
So we have um, tried predicting these and it's very hard. It's quite terrible. Uh, it's hard to predict priming. It's easy to predict uh, response latencies, but hard to predict priming latencies. Okay. So um, if you want to take a go at it, I can give you the data for this. Um, I was involved in this project. And then we are actually currently planning a second round of this project. Okay. One day in the future, when life is not so weird. And so all this type of prediction, of predicting these response latencies and predicting people's responses in any form, whether it be um, timing or be other behavioral data, is, is basically regression. Okay. Because all of this is continuous. And so we can move away from logistic regression because we're not predicting the word choice, now we're predicting speed okay. or opinion or rating. Um, Simple regression is one dependent variable to one independent variable. Multiple regression is when I have two or more independent variables. They don't have to be continuous, but they can be. And one continuous DV. And then if we get into structural equation modeling, that's where we can do all kinds of independence and dependence and mix and match. And this, I like really like multiple regression. I think it's like kind of an underused tool in analytics because everybody's sort of fascinated with machine learning um, because it allows me to think about which variable is the most important. Okay. So we've seen a ton of modeling going on because of COVID and there's so much stuff and people um, building these predictive models and they never really tell you which variable is useful. Okay. So to me one of the limitations of these giant machine learning tools is they're often used to just like give me the outcome, but not what gives me the outcome. And a multiple regression, because I don't have as many variables, um, I can tell you which one's the most important. It's not like you can't with machine learning, it's just most people don't. Okay. So we're going to fit linear models or parametric models, although we could fit non-parametric models where we could think about distributions that aren't normal, right? So Poisson distributions that um, are heavily skewed towards zero. Um, and we could, if we switch to categorical variable, then we'd be back at log regression. So all these things are kind of tied together, depending on the expectation of linearity and normality. So I wanted to just present the regression equation again, so we could kind of highlight what everything we're going to see is. Right? So y hat is our predicted score for each person. In this case, we're going to predict the response latency for words, so the, the timing for each word. V0 or V0 is the y-intercept. This is the average score when all of the x variables are 0. B1 or B2 or B3, etc., are the slope values for each predictor, where slopes are interpreted as for every one unit increase in x, we see b unit increases in y. And this is really great when you have these nice moderately linear relationships, right? If you're trying to predict the stock market, that doesn't do you any good because the stock market is stochastic. I mean, it goes up and down. Um, but many things are, are expect some expectation of linearity, right? Um, and so for every one unit increase in x, let's think. So for every one extra letter, it takes people... 10 extra seconds to read it. It's not that, that's way long, but that's the idea. Uh, and so we'll look at uh, those interpretations. Okay. X is each individual predictor, so we're going to use length, or type, frequency, I think that's it. And then E or epsilon out there is the error for each individual word because we never get the predicted score exactly right. Okay, so these are the residuals. Um, and it's essentially the y score for that person, the actual score, minus their predicted score. So we want to minimize that error and get as close to their predicted score as possible. And so here's kind of like just a picture form of that. Um, regression is a closed form solution. Most people use least squares estimation um, because it will get you the one and correct answer where it minimizes residuals, although there are other ways to come up with a solution if your data set is very, very large. 
I think our computers mostly can handle linear regression pretty well. And what this does is it minimizes E. So it finds the line here that has the where the dots are the closest to the line possible. So when I'm looking at the overall model, and I'm going to approach this from a very traditional statistics sort of view, but I can think about statistical significance by looking at those p-values for an f-test for linear models. It essentially tests if the prediction is better than the y-intercept. So a uh, base level model includes the average score. Can we predict better than average, meaning is the data flat or is it not flat? Now, I think p-values have a time and a place, and that place and time is small. <laughs> and so I always tell people to use a practical measure of significance, too. So how much am I predicting in the data? Because there are many times with very large data sets that we can predict better than flat, but you're only getting like a little bit better than flat. And so I get asked this a lot by like more traditional academics, like, well, my p-value is 0.001, and my r, but my r squared is 0.01. I'm like, you have to decide if 1% of the variance is important to you. What does that translate to practically for your theory or your field? And so this is kind of the question, um, I heard a really great podcast on this once about, like, um, understanding like when to tell terminally ill people when to stop, right? So we can, you know, tell them, well, here's this treatment, it's really terrible, but it will give you 10 extra days. And they have to decide for themselves, like, how much more am I willing to take, so to speak, to get what I get out of it. And so I think, I don't think about practical significance for death reasons, but I think that's kind of a good example of like how much is important for your equation. Okay. Um, so, so there are some really famous studies, the aspirin studies, right, where um, most people know, like if you're going to have, a, if you're having a heart attack, take some aspirin, it's just kind of a blood thinner. Um, and those studies weren't significant traditionally statistically significant, but the effect size was large. So we can actually do this the other way too. So thinking about, is this effect important enough? Will it save us enough lives to be useful? For the individual predictors, we can think about p-values from our t-tests for coefficients. That tells me the coefficient is different from zero. But I can also look at practical significance, significance by um, looking at a partial correlation. PR squared. So let's just try it. So the word column represents the word presented to the participants. So this data set is in Arling, but it's only a small proportion of the English Lexicon Project data. As like I said, the ELP actually contains 40,000 words. This data set I think is like 800 or so, but you'll get the, the idea. Length here is the number of characters. That's really important. Longer words take longer to read. No, no surprise. The subtle subtitle word frequency is that estimate from the subtitle projects. So I think it's parts per million. POS is the part of speech, and mean RT is the response latency in milliseconds. So a thousand um, milliseconds is a second. And uh, what we see here is that most words tend to hover like 500 to 600. And then words that are longer, like de oops, delineated, which is kind of an unusual word, take longer to read. Now, first thing I want to talk about is dealing with categorical predictors. Because I feel like most people are kind of okay with these like correlations, and these continuous predictors. And the instant you throw a categorical predictor at them, they like the brain just shorts out. So <clears throat> when x is continuous, the interpretation is pretty easy. So for every one unit increase in x, we see b unit increases in y. So for every one word, letter, we get x, uh, sorry, b unit increases in response latency. That is a tangible interpretation. But for a categorical predictor, for every one unit increase doesn't mean anything anymore. 
So we have to use dummy coding. Now there are other types of coding that you can use, contrast codings, um, uh, one-hot encodings, like there's like a couple of ways, but dummy coding is the default in R. And if we're in it's what we want for our purposes. Okay, so I stole this from the Andy field. Let's say that we have four categories. So if one were to able to go to music festivals this year, which makes me very sad because everything I had purchased this year has gotten canceled, which is fine. But let's say there are four types of, of people at these music festivals, right? So people who have no affiliation, people who are sort of indie kids, people who are metalheads, and then I don't, again, this is the Andy field, so they're crusty. So with four categories, a one-hot encoding would create a completely binary system with four columns. But dummy coding instead says, well, that's repetitive, and I only need enough columns to create a unique ID for each type of label. So you'll get categories minus one predictors. So if I have four, I'll get three predictors. And the predictors represent the difference in in sort of uh, uh, binary labels. So what I mean by that is like a no affiliation here. Their code, their like unique code is zero zero zero. Okay. Indie Kids unique code is zero zero one. So it kind of creates like a little barcode for each group. I don't need that last column because I have a unique combination for each group. So dummy variable one here will be the group labeled one versus the con the, um, the control group. Okay, and the control group is the group that's labeled with all zeros. Okay. So it'll be crusty versus no affiliation, and then metalhead versus no affiliation, and then indie versus none. Okay. If you wanted to compare the indie kids to the metalheads, you'd have to reorder the variable um, and just run it again. So these end up becoming little mini t-tests, and I know you guys have had t-tests, so essentially it's the difference between the means controlling for everything else. So what we have in our data set is part of speech. Okay, In this particular one we have three categories, JJ that's labeled as adjective, uh, NN for noun, and VB for verb. And the default option in R is that the first one that appears is the comparison category. Okay. And so if I run a little table here on that, what we see is adjectives are the comparison category. It's also one of the smallest categories, um, although not by much for verbs here. But it makes a lot more sense linguistically to make the comparison categories nouns, because nouns are way more frequent than anything else. So I can, I can reorder that by using the factor command. Okay. So what you do is you put in factor. Now there are lots of other commands like re-level and reorder and there's a couple more, but I think base R works fine here. Um, so you put in the name of the column. If you want to update, you can give it a new name if you want. The levels that you want in the order that you want. Okay. Now levels here has to be what's in the data. And so if you called it noun here, it would it would not find that because the data is JJ and NVB. I'm struggling today with the mouse, sorry. Here. Um, so the second argument for factor here needs to be what's already in the data, which is the levels command. And then I actually gave them better names too. So I've got now an adjective and verb. Um, and you'll see that they reordered. And I'm just, I will compare those two tables to make sure I didn't just relabel them. So the goal here is not to just give them new labels. The goal here is to uh, reorder them. So don't write J noun verb and then just give them new names. You want to give them new names and rearrange them. So think of this as a regular expression, if you will. Right. So it's finding all the NNs and replacing them with nouns. All right. The other issue that we have to deal with in linguistics is that um, there's a lot of non-normal data. And we've been dealing with categorical data and kind of security data all semester. 
But if we're going to use a linear regression, we have to think about how frequency is kind of a hot mess, right? So it's distributed by Zipf's law. Zipf's law is inverse power function, where the most frequent word is twice as frequent as the next frequent word, which is twice as frequent as the next one, down. And so if I look at it, just a simple histogram, you can see that this is very, very not normal. Now, this data set is large enough that we can invoke that the sampling distribution is normal, but this is very much we know the distribution underlying this is not normal, and this data is definitely not normal, so we should do something with that. Well, the simplest thing to do is take a, the log of it. Okay, that's what most people do. Okay, now that makes the interpretation a bit more difficult because you're now interpreting the log frequency. So for every one log unit increase in frequency, but most people are fine with this. And so if I take the log right, of my data set, much better. Okay, it's still a little skewed, but that's okay because the data set is quite large. The hard part is interpreting it. Mostly because, like, you don't know what a negative 2 really means anymore. Right? I just have to remember, well, that's negative 2. That means it's a lower frequency. So we have to kind of think about lower frequency to higher frequency. Uh, that's, that's the real problem with taking a, a transform on the data. I generally don't tell people to transform the data because the interpretation matters. But when, this, when you're dealing with word frequencies, they are so skewed, you should always take the um, transform on that variable. All right, so on the homework, I ask you to transform the data. You should use the transformed variable. So don't transform it and then not use it, FYI. Okay. All right, so let us run the model. So we're going to use the LM function that we've kind of talked about off and on this semester. And we've seen this kind of style many times, where it's x is approximated by, so that's the tilde, Y, uh, sorry, y is approximated by x plus x plus x. So we're going to add length. Uh, the word frequency variable uh, logged and part of speech and see how if we can take three variables and predict response latencies. Okay. So on average, can we predict the mean response latency for these items with these three words? Okay. These three variables, rather. And I've just saved it as model. I actually usually tend to do like model.response latency or like model dot something. Um, I think it's because I do a lot of structural equation modeling and so you know model dot fit, <laughs> model dot output, like there's there's um, kind of telling me like this is a saved model output. Because right? those are special types of objects in R. So let's run this from a summary function here and we get everything we need kind of all at once. Now I'm going to show you this running like one little piece at a time, um, but I always just like use the summary function, it's great. But it makes it hard to talk about what's going on, so we're just going to break this down one piece at a time here. Now the residuals are really important because the residuals are the error that we see when we are predicting our variable. You want the, the um, residuals to be normally distributed okay? and um, homogeneic and homoscedastic, the spread of them. Uh, and we'll use this for our diagnostic data screening that we'll do at the end. So I run my residuals. I could just look at them. I can already tell that they're maybe a little bit skewed because the min and the max are not, you know, even on either side of zero the, or the quartile. So the closer the mean and the me I'm sorry, the closer the median and the mean are to each other, aka zero, um, the more normal this will be. Okay. So this is, can tell me maybe I have a bit of skew in my in my um, residuals, which means one of the variables is probably pretty skewed, which we've kind of would we would guess, right? It's still that log of the response latency. It's still a little skewed, but way better than it was. Now I'm going to look at my coefficients first because they appear first and they tell me my which predictors are the most important. And if we look at that table and use p less than 0.05 as sort of the magic line in the sand, um, 
what we see is the intercept score is the average response latency. And so I would be looking at this here, this box. So I'm just going to interpret those for you first. The intercept is our average response latency. I know that's not zero. I don't really care if it's different from zero. I'm going to move on. Length here is a positive predictor. Not too surprising. Longer words take longer to react to. And that is just because it takes you like literally longer for them to get through your eyeballs, right? To the back of your brain and figure out what all the letters are, etc. Frequency is a negative predictor, which is expected. The more frequent a word is, it's faster. Okay. So frequent words are ones we see all the time. And so we read the ones that we've seen all the time faster. Low frequency words are words that are unusual, and so it takes us longer to read them because it's kind of a surprise. Like, oh, what is this word? Okay. Delineated. Okay. Um, or step, step father, brother, mother, something like that. In this data set, adjectives and nouns have the same response latency, whereas verbs and nouns have different response latencies. So I can print those out in this cute little table, coefficients table, and I just rounded it so it wouldn't print 37 decimals that I didn't need. And so what I'm interpreting here is T. Right? So length for every, sorry, for every extra character or letter, we have 20 extra milliseconds. Um, for every one log unit increase in Frequency, we decrease our response latency by 30 milliseconds. Okay. So that's quite a lot okay. if we kind of undo that. Okay. Um, adjectives and nouns are approximately the same. Okay. So here's that interpretation of a, character, of a categorical, categorical variable. Um, what we see is like we have adjective, noun, and verb. Okay. And noun never appears. Well, that's because it's the comparison group. So the one that doesn't show up is the zero category, and that's our control group. So this here is the difference in their means, given all these other variables in the equation. Okay. So they're about six milliseconds different, which is not significant. And verbs and nouns are about 23 milliseconds difference, which is significant. Okay. Now, interpreting these predictors you can sometimes um, just print them out. I really need to update these notes a little bit, but um, so it can help me to understand what's happening by using a means table. Okay. And um, I can see that verbs are responded a little bit faster than nouns, okay. which if we did the math subtraction here, that's like 33 milliseconds, but which doesn't match our numbers over here because remember, that this is the difference in means given everything else. So there's a way to get the actual means controlling for all the other variables. And I think the function you want is gg predict, okay, um, which is in a special package. And I will have to add that to the notes to, to do where we can see instead of looking at the just average score overall in the data set, we can actually look at like, you know, given these other variables, what are the means for each group. But if all else fails, t apply is a great function that just lets me see, like, adjectives are slower than everything else. Okay. <clears throat> can also calculate our confidence intervals. Now, confidence intervals are going to be useful here. Um, towards the end, we do a bit of bootstrapping. Uh, but it also allows me to think about precision. So I know that, that that length variable was about 19 milliseconds, but a confidence interval will give me a good idea of the variability in that range. So it's actually going to be somewhere between 17 and 22 milliseconds. And that is just a measure of their standard error. Oh, sorry. Put your nose here. Here. Can I, can I see them? Here. It's just an estimate of the standard error here, it's basically two times the standard error for a 95% confidence interval. That's pretty close. Um, but I just like thinking about like how, you know, if I did this again, I might get somewhere between 17 and 22.
It might not be 19 every time. Now, calculating PR squared, there are a couple of ways to do this. And um, the, the kind of hack quick and dirty ways to use this formula, that's T for the variable divided by the square root of T squared plus degrees of freedom residual. It's not perfect. There's some other packages that'll kind of calculate this for you, but this is honestly one of the easiest ways. And it gives me a good representation or good estimate of PR squared. Okay. So what is PR squared? So PR squared is the amount of variance in the dependent variable accounted for, meaning, you know, predicted, after I remove the variance for everything else. Okay. So link, after controlling for all the other variables predicts 18% of the unaccounted for variance. That's a lot. Now, um, uh, frequency here predicts 24% uh, of the unaccounted for variance. And I could tell that even though part of speech was significant for verb versus noun, it's probably not worth the trouble because this is less than 1%. Now, the, the tricky part about interpreting PR squared is that it does not add up to one. This is not like giving the variance to variable A or the variable B. This is, you know, um, taking the pi that is the variance in the dependent variable and removing um, for, let's say, length here, for length, taking out everything due to frequency and um, part of speech even if length overlapped those. So there is a correlation between length and, and frequency where longer words tend to be less frequent, but that is controlled for by taking out that variance. Okay, so it's sort of leftover variance for both of them. And so you can get PR squares that add up to over one. Um, so the interpretation has to remember be like the unique variance in the IV and the DV. So you're removing every, every uh, other possible correlation. Uh, this is in comparison to what's called semi-partial correlations that are slightly different math. Okay, those can add up to one. All right, so I can tell my coefficients, right, length and frequency are significant and probably fairly important because they're about 20% of the variance or more in each. Uh, but overall, how much variance is that total? Because I've talked about how they don't, the math does not add up in such a way that they, I can just say, oh, that's like 40% of the variance. It might, but it doesn't. Um, so how much better are we than a random guess? Well, excuse me, oh my goodness. Ah, excuse me. Um, a random guess, a good random guess for regression is always the y-intercept. So the F statistic represents the difference of that model from essentially the y-intercept. Now I have from zero here, but that means like the R squared from zero, no prediction, how good is the y-intercept, that kind of thing. And so we see, we get uh, F here and our degrees of freedom, but if we looked at that summary, here, we get like kind of a more readable version. Okay. And so that is different from zero. We can look at our R squared, which is about 46%, which is pretty good. Okay. I want to show you 46, hold on, 46%. So notice here that 24 plus 18, oh damn, that does add up, but it doesn't have to, okay, I don't expect that to happen. Didn't mean for it to add up. Okay, um, so R squared, big R squared, is the proportion of variance in dv can, you know, for everything. Um, this would probably add up to a little bit more or less than 46. So it's close. That means they don't overlap that much. Um, but it's not perfect. So don't expect them to add up. Is what I'm saying. Okay. So what we say is the overall model seems like it should be important. Okay, and in the behavioral sciences, a model of 46% is like magic, 
people ask you what you did, like, are you cheating over there? What did you do? Um, that's a lot of variance. Okay. Now, I think a lot of analytics people are used to models that predict at 95% or something when you think about categories. But when we're trying to predict continuous data, especially from people, uh, people are very variable. They're predictable, but variable in their predictions. So, and sometimes they're not predictable, right? Um, and so it's hard to predict this kind of variability sometimes. And so I would say 46% is a lot of variance. Right? People would ask me, like, what are you doing? How are you cheating? <clears throat> so I would tell the story, like, oh, here's my three variables. Part of speech was not very good. Um, and then what we see is um, uh, length and frequency are, are very useful. Now I should make sure that my model is appropriate too. So we should always do think about, um, you know, is linear regression the best solution for this type of data? So we can look at outliers. You can look at them beforehand too, but sometimes looking at outliers in the solution is the best approach. Okay. And these are data points that have very large residuals or otherwise just odd. Okay. And my um, other assumptions that we can look for in parametric regression is independence. Okay. Independence is, is testable, but most people just kind of know it's a thing of their data. So um, independence is that um, each data point is uh, different from every other data point. They didn't influence each other. So no repeated measures data, right? You didn't repeat the same word twice. The DV needs to be at least interval or better yet ratio. Well, response latencies are kind of a weird one because they can't be zero just physically, but as a scale, they could be zero. So additivity is another one, or no multicollinearity is probably the other way you've heard it described. Okay, linearity, normality, homogeneity, and homoscedasticity. So there are a lot of rules here. And let's see if we can um, assess if our model meets these assumptions. Okay. So starting with uh, outliers, we're going to look at three components. Okay. One of them is hat values, or leverage, and we've done this before for logistic regression. And that indicates how much influence there is, uh, a single data point's influence on the slope. So you don't want a single data point to have a large influence on the slope because that means they're really changing what's happening in your model. The studentized residuals, this is our z-score difference between a person's predicted and actual score. And then Cook's. So Cook's is a measure of what's called influence. So it's a measure of leverage and discrepancy. So discrepancy is how far away it is from the rest of the data. So if you have like all of your points over here and then somebody way over here, that is a discrepant point. Now, we've looked at this particular plot before. I really love it. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Um, and what it does is it plots hat values down at the bottom. Okay. And there are cutoff scores for these points, and they're based on um, the number of predictors and the number of data points in the data. Okay, so anything out here is really bad, so these are not good. The student ties residuals are marked at 2 and 2 because it's a z-score, so all these points out here are not good. And then the size of the bubble is Cook's, so the bigger, the worse it is. And it's marked people, and I don't totally know how CAR marks these, okay, the CAR package here. Um, I tend to use, when I'm doing my own work, a two strikes, you're out rule. Okay, but I also use Mahalanobis distance, which is a different measure of, of kind of discrepancy. Um, but it's got some internal criterion that I haven't looked up that that's kind of marks people that are particularly bad. Um, and so what we see here are the data points at which it has decided um, are outliers in the solution. Okay. So what we can do is take those numbers here, these are row numbers, and just look at them. Okay. So what do we get here? So I just printed out four of them. 
Um, the first one is interdepartmental, which is a very infrequent, long word. Okay. And so it has a really long response latency. So what I want you to see here is that the ones that are considered outliers have very long response latencies. So they're hard to predict because people are staring at them for a long time. Okay. They're kind of equally distributed between adjectives and nouns, so that variable is not helpful. They're all low-frequency words, okay, which isn't too surprising. Um, and they tend to be longer words, although seven is within the realm of normal words, but whip it is a very unusual word. Okay. And so what would I do? Well, I could take them out and see if they, um, how they impact my model. So look at the change in, in coefficients in R squared. Now these are real words and these are really how people reacted to them. So I probably will leave them in because they're a good representation. They're, they're good data points. Okay. So I have these posts with behind me, garbage in, garbage out. Um, I, I tend to delete outliers because a lot of the behavioral data that we have, it's just people screwing around. Okay. Uh, but if I know the data point is likely accurate, then I shouldn't just delete it because it makes my model better. Okay, you have to be careful there ethically that you're presenting a model of the real data, even if it's hard to predict. Okay. All right, so independence, like I said, is um, the, the each data point is independent from each other, so each data point is a different person, or in our case, they're different words. Okay, we already have talked about how words are intercorrelated, but in this case, that they didn't, they only saw that word on the screen. The dependent variables, at least interval, check. I can look for additivity, okay, where everything adds to the model. There is no uh, multicollinearity by running a correlation on these um, on the predictors. I like this more than the correlation table on the variables because I have a categorical predictor, so I can I can tell based on the dummy coded variable that those categories are not perfectly overlapping or something. Um, whereas if I was to run the correlation on the uh, data frame, I would have to exclude that categorical variable. So I like this option because it allows me to see how the categorical variable is correlated with everything else. Because it might be that one of these predictors, the difference score is very correlated with something else. And you wouldn't have known uh, otherwise. So what we want to do is just make sure there's nothing above 0.9. Okay? Ignore the intercept. That one doesn't count. Okay? And that's what I did here was I dropped the intercept. So I should do negative 1, negative 1, I think, here. But either way. Um, or maybe I dropped the dv. I don't totally remember, but ignore the intercept, uh, which is, I think, the first column, and then I should also ignore the first row, and so we look at everything else. Okay. Remember that the ones on the diagonal here are linked correlated with itself, right? So I can ignore that. And so what we see is nothing is too large. So too large is above 0.9. That's very bad. 0.7 is the range sometimes called suppression. This is when the variables start to act real weird. So you want to kind of stay below that. Another thing we can look at is VIF. Okay. And we did this for logistic regression too, where we look at the variance inflation scores. And we want those to be less than 5 in a perfect world, or less than 10, depends on who you talk to. And in our case, they're all very low. So we're good. Now, there are lots of ways to look at linearity. Um, a lot of people use the normal, normal QQ plot for normality, but I like another picture for normality. Okay. So um, I tend to look at this plot for linearity. You can also look at it for normality. It will give you the same answer for as with the next picture. But what you want is between 2 and 2. So this is 2 and negative 2, which is the, the bulk of the data. Right, that's about 95% of our, our distribution. We want the little dots to line up on the line. you got to be nice to it, though, 
almost every plot I've ever looked at that's not fake data bends away. And so this plot's really good. Most of the data points are pretty nicely laid out. So I would say this is linear. So normality, what I tend to do is calculate the residuals and then z-score them, which has the advantage of giving me a scale. So when I z-score them, I can now see um, the variation around zero. So again, I want them to be between two and two. So I got a little bit of skew out here. And, but most of the data is centered over zero between two and two. So I would say this is pretty normal. And the residuals are fairly normal. A little bit skewed. The last is homogeneity and homogeneity. This is a little bit harder. Okay. So there's a plot option automatic in um, LM, and it kind of like will label some of the bad data points for you. And if you're looking at this plot, what you want is the red line and the dotted line to be the same. And what I tend to look at instead is a is a a plot of the residuals against the fitted data points. So it doesn't matter which one you put on X or Y, but what you do is you uh, take a Z-score of the residuals and a Z-score of the fitted values. Uh, so this is Y hat. For homogeneity, what we want to see is I drew on the zero lines here, like a bullseye, and we want to see that the data is fairly evenly distributed around zero. So this plot runs from 4 to 4, that's pretty good. And this one runs from negative 2 to 4, which is not so good. Okay. So that shows you a little bit of skew, like we saw in our previous picture, okay. and a little bit of vari unequal variance. So it's, there's a little bit more data on this side. Okay. For homoscedasticity, what you want to see is just a bunch of random dots. Because okay. the residuals should be kind of randomly distributed. Good. Oh my gosh, I have to yawn. Excuse me. Okay. Um, what we have here is not good. Okay. We have this like triangle shape. Okay. So the joke is no cheerleaders. So no megaphone shapes where it's small on one end and large on the other. Okay. No rainbow shapes. That would be non-linear data. So we could look at this for linearity as well. Um, and so generally this is bad because it does not make kind of a nice uniform blob of dots. So what do I do about this? Well, for homoscedasticity, you just kind of have to say, well, the data is heteroscedastic. Okay, there's not a lot of fixes for it. You can use heteroscedastically adjusted standard errors. You can bootstrap, um, or you can figure out what the variable is that actually predicts why those are different. Okay, and that's a lot harder. So for researchers, I'm like, why? What is that interaction or spot that's causing that weird shape? Um, the easiest solution, personally, is bootstrapping, which will give me a, a good, a better estimate of standard error and sort of the variability in the um, estimates. Excuse me, can't stop. Okay. So when you are bootstrapping, the first thing that you want to do is build yourself a function. Build yourself a function. So I call this boot coef for bootstrapped coefficients. Okay. Now you can bootstrap any particular um, uh, parameter estimate that you are grabbing. So I could bootstrap f, it could bootstrap r squared, p r squared, whatever. But here I'm bootstrapping the coefficients. In my function, I'm going to put in the, um, the formula for the linear model, the data to randomize, and uh, this is not this is not random. Like I need to change this word here, but um, the last, very last argument is how it's going to bootstrap. Okay. So index, random, whatever you want to call it here. Okay. And so I am going to have it randomly sample by row. Okay. So this is not randomized like scramble. This is randomly sample um, by row. Uh, don't do by column because then it will freak out. <laughs> so. This basically tells it to sample from rows, which is pretty common. Our model here is our formula that we're going to add 
given the randomly sampled data, and I'm going to tell it to return back to me the coefficients. And then we're going to use the boot library to actually run the bootstraps. So in our boot here, we put in the arguments that we made. So formula, data. Now you don't put an indice here because indice is the last one's always where does the randomized data come from, not randomly sampled data come from. The statistic here is the name of our function. And R, which is an unfortunate labeling here, is the number of randomized bootstraps. So kind of a quick reminder before we look at these results, bootstrapping. What is bootstrapping? Well, bootstrapping is where you take your data frame, and let's say it has 200 rows. Okay, and you randomly select from the data frame with replacement until you have 200 rows again. But because you've allowed for replacement, those 200 rows are not just the data again. It's a, it's a representation of the data where we know that row 7 might be a rep, um, an example of seven different people in the world. So we might repeat row 7 several times because, you know, row 7 represents this subset of people that are like row 7. And so the data frame is still the same size as your data set but it's a, a selection of randomly sampled rows with replacement. That's the key. Whereas before, I think in cluster analysis, we ran permutations. Permutations where you randomly scramble the data and hope that your data, your analysis doesn't occur. Okay. So with permutations, you like scramble up the data and see how many times the scrambled data matches your model. And you hope not. So your model is, is not very likely in randomized data, because if your model is likely in randomized data, that's not good. Whereas bootstrapping is like, let's create representative data sets that are similar to what I currently have and see how stable my parameters are. So this gives you a better estimate of standard error, um, given, especially given the heteroscedasticity problem that we've already seen. So what we want to look for here is this um, bias and standard error. Mostly here we want to look at standard error. And those hopefully match the standard errors from our model. Now they shouldn't be, they may not be exactly the same, but they should be good of representation. If they're very large or very different, that implies something is not good. Um, <clears throat> bias is kind of a measure of how different they varied across um, bootstraps, All right, so a low bias score would be good. Uh, and then these numbers here are the coefficients in order. So this is in the same order. So T1 here is the intercept, T2 is length, frequency, nouns um, versus adjectives, nouns versus verbs. I think. <clears throat> Uh, I can also tell it to give me my confidence interval. You kind of have to do this one at a time. So index number three means, you know, one, two, three here. Since I said that frequency was the most important thing, let's see. And the choice here is kind of up to your research area. I tend to pick normal confidence intervals because I expect my data to be normal. Um, you can also predict do Bayes ones out here but I would compare this confidence interval to my other confidence interval. Okay. If they're roughly the same, that implies that your model, the original model that we presented, is pretty, pretty consistent okay, across all these bootstraps of the data. Now this data set is large, I would expect that. Okay. This um, Bootstrapping is not the solution to small data sets but it can help you understand how variable or how kind of un how your parameters work in small data sets. All right, so in summary, uh, we've talked about some very important linguistic product projects that you could use for your final project um, if you're interested, and they have some useful data, allows us to test hypotheses and allows us to set parameters for other models, which we use linear regression to work on predicting things using these data sets. And then we talked about the assumptions of linear regression, 
because um, it's important to think about those things and almost every other analysis we've done has not had a lot of assumptions. So this is one of the ones that has a lot of rules. Factor analysis also has a lot of these same assumptions um, and you should have covered how to think about those in your 500 course. And then a little bit on bootstrapping. In case those assumptions aren't met, um, just to make sure that the model you're presenting uh, represents the data.